those of you who are worshiping online, I want to say God bless you. You are very welcome to God's presence. We want to thank God for how he has been teaching us uh, and um, how he has been speaking to us from his word. I believe very much that God has great plans for us as a people in this end time. I always say if you survive anything, maybe you survive uh, an accident, you survive a sickness, a challenge or whatever, uh, and at this time surviving a pandemic, I want you to know that it's not for the sake of, it's, just, it's not for fun. God has a plan for your life. That's why you are still breathing. And so we must continue to tap into the reason why God has kept us. You have heard from me many times, those of you that have listened to me for some years, that I would have died many, many times, many, many times. At times when I sit down, I, remember, I try to remember the number of times God has spared my life. It amazes me that I'm still alive and breathing, I tell you. But every occasion calls for me to reflect on the fact that I must definitely continue to fulfill my assignment for the Lord. So let's continue to be encouraged. And I want you to know that God himself will help you fulfill destiny in the name of Jesus. So you are very welcome to today's service. By the grace of God, we are starting a brand new series today titled Unraveling the Mystery of Godliness. Let's give the Lord a big hand. A big hand. Hallelujah. As you can see in our banner, the context of the banner is, is um, something I try to get a picture that just captures a little bit of what I believe God is laying on my heart for emphasis in every series. The topics are usually listed on one banner and then we move from topic to topic. We'll be highlighting it by the little star throughout the nine weeks, this month and next month by the grace of God. And um, you can see a picture of clear waters at the sort of river bank where you've got some stones to the right where the water is not covering them. But you see to the left on the picture, you can see that it's got clear water and yet you can see the rocks under. Now, the Bible make, reminded me about the washing of the water by the word, that that is the church that God is preparing. He's preparing for himself a glorious church by the washing of the water by the word. Our godliness will be such that God will cause our lives to be seen through the word. I said your life will be seen through the word in the name of Jesus. The same way those stones can be seen through the water very clearly. And I want to assure you, as many as connect to this, this is how it means. What that means is that you, are, you will be living life supernaturally, naturally. You are in this world indeed, you are not of this world, and you find yourself attaining and doing things that are clearly as an indication of your connection to the spirit of godliness. And so by the grace of God, as we go through these topics, God will be opening the word to us, and I want to encourage you to connect. As I always say, make sure you miss no, no series, uh, no part of the series, connect to it. These days, they are always all online after we do the messages. But you know, it's good to be there physically, if you can, because it helps you to catch the very first time it was said. And then when you go over it again, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some things settle for you when you hear it the second time. So it's good to hear it the first time so that you can let it settle for you the second time. And God will bless you in Jesus' name. And so this uh, mystery of godliness, obviously, we, it, it's come from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which is our key scripture. We will read it throughout the next five weeks uh, for the first five sessions of the nine-part series. And 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Somebody say number one. He was manifested in the flesh. I can't hear you. Thank you. Number two, he was justified in the spirit. Number three, he was seen by angels. Number four, he was preached among the Gentiles. Number five, he was believed on in the world. And number six, he was received up in glory. Hallelujah. Paul said to his protege, Timothy, great is this mystery of godliness. Those of you that were here in the power tower, the brethren that have spoken today have captured quite a lot of my heart for the message. God bless you, both the power tower and even the Bible reading. 
And um, I discovered that God has a way of speaking to us. In the power tower, Brahemi was telling us and reminding us how a mystery is a secret. Something that you cannot understand, but is true. Something that is not easy to understand, but yet holds a lot of validity. The Bible says this thing of godliness is a mystery. And Paul said it is a great mystery. Six things. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached on among the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world and then he was received up into glory. And every time we as believers understand this, every time we go into this mystery, we unravel it the more. That's why the title of the whole series is called Unraveling the Mystery of Godliness. When we hear this verse, we always think about Jesus Christ because it's all about him. He's God that was manifest in the flesh. So there's no doubt he's talking about Jesus. But we must understand, one thing I want you to learn from this topic and this series this time is to understand that the mystery of godliness, even though it's centered around Jesus, is also to have full expression in your life. And this is why we are starting with the very first thing called manifested in the flesh. That is the title of today's message, manifested in the flesh. You see, the physical birth of Jesus Christ underscores the significance of the physical birth in humanity. That God was manifest in the flesh means that there is a significant thing in you being born in the flesh. You see, we always jump to new birth, which is the next thing, justified in the spirit. But before you go to new birth, you must understand that there is a significance in you being physically born into the earth, that is why Jesus had to be physically born in the, into the earth. Listen, he's coming back soon. We talked about that all of last week from Sunday. He's coming back soon. And he could have come the way he's coming now with a glorified body, not through a woman, the first time. Nothing stops him. Nothing stops him. He has all power. He could have just come that way and just preached his message in the heavens and zap everybody up who believes. <laughs> he could have done that. But the Bible says there is something about godliness that he manifested in the flesh. And so this morning, I'd like you to, whatever you have heard about this message before, I'd like you to just do yourself a favor by putting it aside just for about 45 minutes or to an hour at the most. Put it aside and let's listen to what God wants to say to us today. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And then the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We quote this almost everywhere in this world on Christmas or at Christmas, which is very true. But the key thing there is that unto humanity a child is born. A child is born and a son is given. And I've always told you that there is a difference, even though it's the same person, there's a difference between the born child and the given son. What God wants you to be is to start out as the born child but become also a son. John 1, 12 says, For as many that received him, he gave them the right and the power to become the sons of God. Not just the babies of God, but the sons of God. God wants you to move, obviously, from being born physically into sonship. Now, we will deal with sonship next week. We will deal with all that from next week. But I want you to know the importance of being manifest in the flesh today. John 1, 14 was so important. We read earlier on, Ramathias led us in reading John chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 14 in our scripture reading. And verse 14 says, and the word became flesh. Someone say the word became flesh and dwells amongst us. He became flesh. John 1, 1 says in the beginning was that word and that word was God and that word was with God. So it talks about him being God talks about him being with God, which talks about the Trinity, which means that something was God, but at the same time he was with God. That means it had a distinct personality. That's what John 1-1 is all about. 
And he said, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then that word became flesh, manifested in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. So as God was manifest in flesh through Christ, as a first step in this mystery, we also must understand that we have a partaking of the mystery as we are also manifested in the flesh. You cannot be a partaker of the mystery of godliness if you are not born of a woman. The first thing that happens to you in this life is that you are born of a woman into the world. Yes, we can all quickly say, oh yeah, we are born, we are born into sin, we are born sinners. But listen, friends, the first thing is that God was manifest in the flesh. You and I have a chance for godliness because we are also born of a woman. We are manifest in the flesh. And the Bible says, as he is, so are we. First John chapter 4, verse 17. It says, Lord, love has perfected among us in this. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, somebody say, as he is, so I am in this world. Say, as he is, so I am in this world. So if he was manifested, say, so if he was manifested in the flesh, I am also manifested in the flesh. If he was justified in the spirit, I should also be justified in the spirit. If he was seen by angels, I should also be seen by angels. If he was preached among the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, my life should also be a shining light. Say, if he was received up into glory, I shall also be received up into glory in the name of Jesus. Give the Lord a big hand for your life and my life and our lives. This is why the six things have been condensed into five for the month of May. Manifested in the flesh is our first session. Next week, we'll look at the power of justification. And then the, the third week, we will look at ministered to by angels. And then that is angelic, receiving angelic ministration. And then the fourth week, we will combine how he was preached on among the Gentiles and believed on in the world into what we call the mystery of shining lights, as the Bible calls us, the light of the world. And uh, hallelujah. And then the sixth thing is that we will look at being received up into glory, our inheritance of glory. So those are the first five parts which we'll cover in this month of May. And then in the next month, we will look at other aspects of this mystery that are not necessarily captured in that frame, but are also scriptural. So I want you to really be connected because I am very confident this will change your life. I am so confident, so confident this will change your life. It will reset something about your status in God and give you more audacity against the enemy. You see, when you see yourself as somebody and you, that... that you, that, you, that you think you are instead of the person that you should be, there is a big difference. The person that you should be is what is key in God's presence, in God's sight. The person he has made you. And so let's understand that as we learn, God is going to help us into this in Jesus' name. So I want to quickly share, us, share with us four aspects of Christ's humanity that we are to learn from. Four things about Christ's being manifested in the flesh that we ought to learn from. Now, one thing that separates us clearly from Christ is that he never sinned. He knew no sin. We'll talk about that next week. You know, even though the Bible says he was justified in the spirit, the justification in the spirit has separate components that we will talk about. So it wasn't about sin. However, we look at Christ's life and we must learn. The first thing I want us to note, and please write this down, is that he was purposefully fashioned in and born through the womb of a woman. John 1.14, he was manifested in the flesh, that's fine. But how? He was purposefully fashioned in and born through the womb of a woman. That is very important. 
Luke chapter 1, verse 31. When the angel came and spoke to Mary, he said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Somebody say purpose. You shall call his name Jesus. In Matthew's account, he said, For he shall save his people. And then verse 32 says, And he will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. Somebody say purpose. So it was not an accidental birth. Go back to verse 31. He said, And you shall behold, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And shall call his name Jesus. This is why we must understand that every one of us has been purposefully created by God. This is why we take very importantly the naming of children, the praying for children, the dedication of children. We take them seriously because the same way he was manifested in the flesh and they took so much notice of the fact that he had to be given a particular name. He was not called Simon. He was not called Peter. He was not called Paul. He was not called Andrew. He was not called any of those names, as good as some of them may be. He was not even called David, even though he is the son of David. He was not called David because the name Jesus means he will be the savior of mankind. A purpose. Somebody say purpose. Everyone who is manifested in the flesh came with that same thing called purpose. Wherever you are, wherever you are, never let the devil tell you that you are here and you are just doing aimlessly, you are just living from day to day. You have a purpose. The same way the angel was so specific about the coming of Christ and said you will bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. That is the same way you and I must understand that we did not find ourselves here by accident. I've said this many times. Your parents may say to you, we did not expect you. We just suddenly found that you were coming. Some will even say, we tried to, you know, I'm telling you. <laughs> some, some people have been told that we tried to get rid of you. Somehow we thought you had gone. And then suddenly after four months, they, they say you are still there. <laughs> because you have a purpose. Somebody say purpose. I'm the, I'm the fourth of four children that were born to my parents. Only two of us are left now. I never met one of them at all because he died before I was born. I was second born. But my parents told me that um, the moment they had my sister, my sister is the one before me, the moment my elder, late elder brother, who died a few years ago, about five years ago, six years ago now, and um, when they had him and then later on they had my sister, you know, Four years later, they just suddenly found that I was coming. And they, didn't, they were not expecting me at all. My father, he, was, he wanted to be a modern family back in the 60s. So those days, people used to have five, five children, six children. But he wanted two, three maximum. But then he thought he had given birth to three children. One was no more at that time. So he was happy. One boy, one girl, you know, equation balance. And then suddenly I showed up. <laughs> After four years, I just showed up from, from nowhere. So he looked at it and said, this must be a David. Hallelujah. That is why he gave me that name. And I'm thankful to God he gave me that great name. Hallelujah. So you have a purpose. Psalm 139 verse 13. He said, for you formed me in the inward parts. You formed me. He formed you in the inward parts. When you were shaping up and you, you were, and, and you were fashioning up and, and, and these days, if you look at a child developing in the womb, you can almost see those processes. There is some hand there that is forming that person. He said, you formed me, you formed my inward parts and covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, verse 14. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. Verse 15 says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 16 says, you saw, your eyes saw my substance, yet being unformed. <laughs> but and in your book they were all written somebody say designed say specifications 
in your books they were all written the days fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them everything about you has been properly documented what you and i need is to unravel the mystery of godliness that we are walking in as being manifested in the flesh to be able to understand what had been written aforetime before us now god's sovereignty he reveals to us as he chooses he can reveal to you 10 years time. He can reveal to you one year at a time. But the key thing is you walk with him. When you walk with him, what you need to know per time is clear. When you know what God is saying about you, you live life differently. You don't live arrogantly, but you live confidently. The wishy-washy Christian that we have today is because somebody doesn't understand that they were formed and fashioned in the womb. I've never looked at another man and felt less handsome to them. Never, not in my life. Even as a child when I didn't know anything. I'm the most handsome man on this planet. <laughs> Hallelujah. When I was in a former church, I said, my wife is the most beautiful woman on the planet. And all the men there were very angry with me. I said, go and say the same thing about your wife. <laughs> don't be angry with me. All of them were there. Well, what do you mean? I, 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 don't be angry with me. You have mouth, I have mouth. <laughs> You have wife, I have wife. I said, my wife is the most beautiful on the planet. You're angry. Why are you angry? You two say the same thing. <laughs> There's no need to be angry. Hallelujah. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is key. God told me to tell you to do this today. Take your phone, if you have one, and you can reach it. Take your phone, put on the camera, and do as if you want to do a selfie. I know you know how to do that very well. Do as if you want to do a selfie. Look into that phone. Look into that phone very quickly, very quickly, very quickly. Who do you see there? If you are seeing me, that means you are not doing a selfie. <laughs> Raise your phone and look inside. Who do you see there? You see who? You see yourself. Say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Say, I am handsome. If you are, if you are a woman, say, I'm beautiful. <laughs> we don't want you to be handsome. <laughs> say, I am handsome. I'm the right height. Say, I am the right color. I'm the right physique. Everything about me has been crafted in his books. Look at that picture again and say, mm, 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 mm. Say, this is beautiful. This is handsome. This is lovely. This is wonderful. Now give the Lord a big hand of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Always do that to yourself. When you stand in front of the mirror, don't say, ah, this my wrinkles, they are coming out. <laughs> say, wow, say another beautiful sign of glorious aging. <laughs> when you see the next gray hair, don't pour dye on it. How many dye do you want to be dying? <laughs> All of our classmates, when we posted some pictures of our recent, these are classmates from secondary school, almost 40 years ago, we posted some pictures of our recent, um, what we look like, and some of them had black hair. I said, all of you with black hair, then you are lying. <laughs> Whatever you are putting on it, you better stop. <laughs> How long do you want to put it? <laughs> enjoy it. If the gray is coming out, enjoy it. It is a sign that you have passed through time. It's a sign that you have passed through wisdom and that you have gathered some things in the sands of time. Don't say, ah, see my gray hair is coming out. I've not built a house. I've not done it. No, 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 no. Enjoy the moment you have because you know something? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. He told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4, he said, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, verse 5, he said, before you were born, I sanctified you. Before you were born. Your sanctification is not taking place after you were born. You, you did not get born into this world and then God now said, ah, this one, can he be saved or not? No, 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 no. You were already sanctified. You just need to walk into it as you are born. And this, is, this will take me to our next Point where we need to understand how we as individuals and particularly as parents looking at the life of Jesus need to help one another walk into that which God has ordained for us before our time. The Bible says before you were born I sanctified you and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Number two, 
So the first thing is that we, we saw in the life of Jesus that he was purposefully created in and he was purposely fashioned in and given birth through the womb of a woman. Number two. Now, this might surprise you, but he was a vulnerable child who needed parental help. Just to show us part of this mystery, Jesus was a vulnerable child, a child who could have been killed if his parents did not help him. And this is very important for us, especially as parents. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child. Take the young child. Somebody say the young child. Listen to me here. Take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. As God as he is, there is a man that wants to destroy him. And if you don't take that child and flee as God as he is, there is a potential that he will be destroyed. Take the young child and flee. This is God speaking through an angel now. Take the young child and flee. The Bible says in verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night. That was how serious it was. Took them by night and departed for Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord through the prophet saying, out of, the, out of Egypt I called my son. A prophecy had gone ahead, but there was a need for parental involvement to make that prophecy happen. Even though it's a prophecy about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself could not make that prophecy fulfilled without the help of his parents, especially Joseph. That's why I said, Brother Matthias tapped into my notes before he, he prayed this morning, because I was going to read to you also Psalm 127, verse 3. The Bible says, these children are a heritage of the Lord. Let's put it there, verse 3. It said, they're a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb is his reward. And verse 4 says, like the arrows are in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Very important. Like arrows are in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. We must learn how to take care of children. Now, I want to speak to parents here. There is something you and I must understand. That our marriages, husband and wife, is beyond, significantly beyond those vows of I do and I do that we say. We hardly make any vow about children. I've never seen any marriage where they say, I behold you with all my body, with all my flesh, and you say, I do, I do, and then they say, and all our children, we are committed to them. Nobody says that. But they should be putting it. Because maybe, if we put it, we will be remembering before we do those useless separations and those useless divorces, we will be thinking about those children before we take those selfish de de decisions to go separate ways and leave these vulnerable young children that Herod is looking to kill, looking to destroy. Maybe, just maybe, if we are told that yes, we are committed to each other, we must not betray each other, but something also will happen in the course of our commitment to each other. They are called children. They are a heritage of the Lord and they will come through this union and we must be committed to making sure that they are brought up in the way of the Lord and given adequate protection from Herod who seeks to destroy them. So that the prophecy of their own being manifested in the flesh to fulfill purpose will also be satisfied. Thank God for people like the parents of Moses. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 says, By faith, <laughs> Moses, when he was born, let's read it together, let's read it together now. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months. By who? By his parents. Because they did what? They saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. The word beautiful there doesn't just mean beauty as in beauty to behold. They saw, some translations say they saw that he was a goodly child. Hallelujah. He was a goodly child, a beautiful child. I want you to understand every child that God brings through every union is a goodly child. 
Every child you see walking the streets aimlessly today and messing up, many cases it is tied to poor parenting or lack of it completely. In all probability, most children that are in prison today and are not, not those just indicted or incriminated falsely, you know, there are some sadly like that. But in all probability, most children, 70-80% of children or young people who are in prison today, check the root of the problem is either bad parenting or no parenting. In five years, mama has been with five men. And this six-year-old boy is confused. What does it mean to be, to have a father? In 10 years, papa has moved Three women in and out of the house, and they are all partners. Partners today, gone tomorrow. Partners day after tomorrow, nothing like that. Day after, I will kill you, fifth day number four. So this young boy grows up in an environment where he thinks women are to be used and dumped, and when it doesn't work, you kick them out. By faith, Moses! By faith, Moses! When his parents saw that he was a goodly child, they hid him. Every parent must understand that we have a responsibility that goes beyond us. This is why when I counsel couples, I tell them, always see beyond yourself. The commitment that you have to one another is solid. There's no doubt about that. You must keep that sane. You must keep it sanctified. You must keep the marriage bed undefiled. Do all those things the Bible says, but never forget that over and above, there is a big heritage of the Lord that God has put to you from that one child, that two, those two children, those three children, five children, whatever the numbers may be. You must wake up on a daily basis asking yourself how you are committing to making sure that those children that are manifested in the flesh through your womb and through your loins are given the best support and the protection from every Herod. Herod may not be in our times a king that is sat on a throne making rules. The Herod of our time are on the dark net. They are on the internet. They are on those places that many people don't even know exists. They give advice to young people on how to commit suicide. They tell young people how to take drugs and their parents will not know. They expose them to pornographic sites. They expose them to things that can put them into slavery, child slavery, child pornography. They are the heralds of these times. Seeking day and night to destroy those children, but instead of parents to take time to pray together, they are fighting against themselves. Set of parents to pray and say, Lord, give me insight to know what you have in stock as a plan for this my child A and this my child B and child C and D and E and, and, and let me have insight to be able to support them. We're fighting our spouses and fighting our wives and fighting our husbands. Living selfishly every day. We must go beyond selfishness and move to selflessness so that we can bring about a generation that God wants to raise. Everyone manifest in the flesh, particularly those children that have come through us, we have a deep responsibility. When we dedicate children in this place, we tell the parents, you have a responsibility to make sure that they get born again. You have a responsibility to guide them, to keep them. And then we all as witnesses stand as a support system. There are many of my age mates today who are sending their children to this country from Nigeria, sending their, or, or other countries, sending their children to this country to do their masters, do their first degrees and masters because we are all about that age now, having children in the 20s, late teens, 20s. That's about most of my mates. So many of those kids come around. As soon as they're touching the country, their parents are ringing me. My son is in, is in Stafford. My son is in London, UCL. This one is that. Because we support each other. We must keep watching over those children. One of them for, for 15 months, two years ago. 15 months, the girl was not going to school at all. None of us knew anything. She just sat in the hostel and locked herself up. Her visa expired, everything expired. Parent was still paying 15,000 pounds a year, not knowing that their daughter was not in class. The devil just came and sat on her. This is a, a pastor's daughter. The pastor, a friend of mine, would not have known until he realized that he said, let's meet in the U.S. next summer for holiday. The girl said, okay. He didn't even, she didn't even tell them anything. She just said, okay. Then they all flew all the way. I think they went somewhere, Washington or something. Then they got there waiting for her. When is your flight? When are you coming? They said, I can't travel. My passport is this. And what are you telling me? And then the whole story came out. And then my friend called me and said, Brother Dave, I'm so sorry. I should have told you. 
I didn't know, you know, I should have told you that my daughter was this, and you know, if you probably checked on her. I said, my dear brother, even if you told me, we need prayer for these children. Even if you told me, it's only my prayer that can help. If I call her, you say, get out of my sight, you know, who are you? <laughs> who do you think you are? Get out. <laughs> I spoke to one 23-year-old just about two weeks ago. And she was rude, very rude. And I said to her, I said, I have a child that's your age, you know. I care about you. That's why I'm talking to you this way. My child is your age, exactly your age. I said, where have you guys lost all this respect? She said, have I finished speaking? <laughs> I said, are you done now? I said, yes. She just hung up the phone. That's the world we are living today, friends. That is the Herod we are dealing with today. We have work to do. So, friends, I know I've overscored this point, but it is, it, you can't overflow it. If you understand, it will minimize some of those little, little things. Where did you put my toothbrush? Hey, I told you my toothbrush should be here. And then the whole day, you are not talking to each other. Because somebody moved your toothbrush from this side of the sink to this side. Ah! <laughs> There are more important things to do, friends. The devil is not playing. Let us take time. If angels had to warn Joseph to take Jesus Christ and flee, we must understand that these children need our help. Jesus could have flown to Egypt. He is Jesus. God could have taken him and zapped him into Egypt. Number three. He was a studious child. Jesus himself was a studious child who demonstrated growth. So very important, we need to understand. Jesus went into the temple to study. Luke chapter 2, verse 46. He said, now it was after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now I want to turn the table over to the young people hearing me. At this point in time, Jesus was just 12 years old. The Bible makes us to understand that the parents were still guiding him. They went to the temple. They went to Jerusalem to worship. And when they were leaving to go back, he was not with them. And then suddenly they traced their way back. About three days journey, went back and found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them. I want to challenge you young people. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. Even if it doesn't make sense now, present yourself in the temple. Present yourself with God's people. Start to identify with God's people. Many of us were just throwing ourselves into the things before we actually understood what it meant to be born again. We were born again at age 10, then we did not understand for many years, but we kept on going to the temple. Going to the temple, then we did realize that, oh, we have been born again since. <laughs> but thank God for all those journeys today. Keep throwing yourself in the temple, young people. There is no safety outside. There is a world that is telling us that the things of God are becoming old-fashioned and they're trying to convince you not to bother to do those things. They are liars, they are deceits, and these are the things you have to protect, protect yourself against. Jesus presented himself in the temple and he demonstrated that he was willing to grow. He never started his ministry until he was 30, 30 years old and he did it for three and a half years. So as a young adult, as a child, as a young adult, he, as a teenager and as a young adult, he continued to grow and learn. Luke 2, verse 52, tells us, And Jesus therefore increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Somebody say, Jesus increased. Jesus increased. When you are manifested in the flesh, God expects increase. He expects growth. Realize that you are born to grow. You are born to increase. As you are finding yourself, as you find a child moving from the physical stages of life, learning how to sit down, learning how to walk, learning how to do those things, you must understand that you should also be seeing them grow in favor with God and with men. They should also grow with spiritual wisdom. You expect them to start to understand more the things of God. So you invest in them. Proverbs 22 verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. We come back to parents now. Whilst it is the child's responsibility to also seek to grow, parents must understand that we must train up a child. The word train there, I always like to use a physical train to illustrate it. 
When you see a physical train, the first thing that you look for is where the engine is located and where it is moving to. Because wherever that engine is going, that is where the whole body and the carriages will follow. So when the Bible says train up a child, it means lead a child. Provide leadership for a child the way he should go. My children have never seen me in any place that I don't expect them to go. Never. Not in their life. If I don't expect them to be there, I can't go there and then now tell them don't go there. I can't be doing smoke like this <laughs> every day and then I say, son, son don't, don't, don't smoke. You see, this thing is very bad for you. <laughs> no, no, no. They've never seen me do it. Never. If you are not training up a child by leadership, in all probability, you are going to ask them to do things that they will find difficult to do. Make it a habit. If you don't let children love coming to church by you showing excitement when you are coming to church, they will see church as a drudgery. I'm passionate about church because I was born by the grace of God, by parents who love church. Sunday in our house was a bubbly day. Everybody woke up and you are looking forward to get to church. That was the environment. By the grace of God, that's what we still create today. Children must be taught the right things. Train up a child the way he should go because he's manifested in the flesh to go a certain way towards his destiny. You have to provide the guidance. You have to train that child the way he should go. And when he grows, he will not depart from it. We must seek to grow like Jesus. I always say he grew from the born child to the given son. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, when I was a child, I like this verse so much, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. It's all permitted. You are a child. When your five-year-old child asks you some questions, don't you, don't you have a little giggle and just laugh? But because you know his age or her age, you overlook it. But when he turns 15 and he's still asking that kind of question at times, you, you, you want to scratch your head to be sure everything is still okay. <laughs> because those kind of questions should no longer be a 15-year-old a, a question. You expect some other kind of things. He said, when I was a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We must learn that we all have a responsibility to put away childish things. When I became a man, I put away childish things. I became a man, I put away childish things. So it's very important that Jesus was a studious child. He loved going to the temple. He loved asking questions and answering questions. He loved learning about his father. And he loved determining and understanding his own purpose. By the time he will appear in the temple as a 30-year-old in Luke chapter 4, he stood up and read where it was written that the spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. He was no longer there asking questions and knowing what is happening. He was now an authority. He said he has anointed me to preach the good news and he said today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Hallelujah. You must let children come into form. Let children come into form. Some children come into form earlier than others. That's okay. That's okay. The things I could do as a 15-year-old, my late elder brother, I didn't see him do many of those things before he was 19, 20. By 15, I could drive. I had one thing like that. They called it learner's permit in my country. One piece of paper like that. I drove for about three years on that thing, praying that nobody would catch me one day because it's so easy to catch me. I was looking so tiny, and I was not yet of age. <laughs> but I drove like that for three years. Please don't go and do that kind of thing here because it can mess your record forever. But the reality was that I was very quick with many things. My mother, by the grace of God, yesterday was her birthday to the glory of God. She turned 85 years old. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. My mother would sit with me when everybody had gone to school. I told you my, 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 my siblings were four years and eight years older than me. So they would have all gone to school. It only remained me, uh, she and myself. And we would sit down. I was only three years old. Then she would bring out some ladybird books that they would say, this is a frog. I live by the pond. And she was teaching me those things. So by the time I was three, fully three, I could read. 
She taught me how to write. I could write. She saw that this little one has a potential. When I, one day at age four, I just said to her, I'm going to school. They said, you can't go to school. Everybody goes to school at six. I said, I'm not staying home today. So they thought I was joking. They packed my bag and packed everything as if, because my dad used to do that a lot. He, he thinks he could deceive me. He would take me in a car that is going somewhere else. If I insist I want to go, he would, they would drive me to another place. <laughs> when we get to the place, I know that that's not where we're supposed to go. <laughs> so he stopped doing all those kind of things for me. So this day, he packed a bag for me. He thought by packing the bag and me going, when I get to the school by myself, I'll say I'm coming back. He didn't know that that's the day I was going to start school, for real. So when I got to the school, I walked straight on. And he was just looking when my brother and my everybody went to where they were going. He came out and he called me, said, let's go back home now. I said, no, I'm in school. They should put me in my class. So I started to make a scene. I said, I'm not going home. I'm not going home. So the headmistress came out. She's a woman that was married to a British man at that time, Mrs. Lavas. Not, not, not Eastern Nigerian, but married to a British man, Scottish man. And uh, Miss Lavas came out. He said, well, what's happening at the gate? He said, my dad said, please, don't, don't, be, don't be sorry. We're sorry about this. It's just uh, we, he needs to go back home. He said, no, 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 let him stay. Then he called me. He said, what's your name? I said, it's David. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to start school. He said, you're too young. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm four years old. He said, you're too young. I said, ma, I can write my name. He said, for you? I said, I can't even read books. <laughs> she said, come. And she took me to her office, gave me a slate. In my days, you start writing with chalk on a big board called slate. I said, I don't use this anymore. Give me paper. She said, whoa. <laughs> so they gave me a piece of paper and a pencil. And of course, a, a toddler's writing is funny. My, it is wiggled a bit. But I spelled my name D-A-V-I-D. The woman was, oh. she'd never seen a thing like that. She said, get him. Those days, uniforms were always in the store. Say, get him his uniform. He starts school today. They brought out my shorts, the shorts that should look like shorts. It was going to this place for me. <laughs> the shirt was up to this, the short sleeve shirts was up to here. I stood there. They marched me into class one. I was looking funny, and everybody was like, Where did this one come from? <laughs> that was 1973. That was the beginning of my study life. So by the time I was 20, I was out of university as a civil engineering graduate. Everything fast, fast, fast. Some children are like that. Yes, you want to clap, clap for Jesus, that's fine. Now, I never made that a standard for any of my children. Never. In fact, the law here will not permit it anyway. So, so no long story. But I can't because I was at 20, I was a graduate, and now harass all of them. Like, you're at 20. <laughs> Every child has his form. Every child has his purpose. Some preachers have forced their children into things that they should not be. You cannot force anyone into anything. You should understand that God has a plan. Just seek to grow as children, and we as parents must always be helping. It takes discipline, friends. You see, at times when we have children and we're trying to say, take care of them, it's not because we don't like children or we don't, it's because we understand that the discipline we give to children grows with them. If you teach a child how to be settled in public from home, when he gets to public, he will be settled there. Many years ago, I used to represent the university and uh, travel to West Africa, to, to University of Wolverhampton, to go and recruit students. This was many years, over 16 years ago now. And uh, because Nigeria those days and most of those countries, the credit cards, those, the cards don't work. So we had to take cash. So at times we withdraw money like 2,000 pounds, you know, 3,000 pounds to pay for our hotel bills and all the bills. We have to take cash like that. Thank God they don't do that anymore now. If not, they'll kidnap somebody. With <laughs> anyway, I went into the bank to go and cash the check that the university gave me. It was that time, I don't know, 1,800 pounds or something. I went with my children. They were six years old, three years old, and two years at that time. And as I presented the check, we were in the queue for more than one hour. They would take your picture. They will, they will they take your, only your blood they don't take. <laughs> only your blood. Every other thing, you pose like this, they snap this part. You pose like this, they snap. Just because you want to cash a check of, in this country, a check of under 2,000 pounds. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, we were going through all that. And the children were there with me. Six years, I'm telling you, six years, three years, and two years. 
I didn't know the woman was watching. For the one hour we were there, they never, I never raised my voice once to say, come back here, or don't go there, or don't touch that. They stood there. Stood there. And the woman could not resist after we finished for about an hour. She could not resist. She said, please, there's one more thing. I said, oh, no, what is this she was asking? <laughs> he said, are those your children? I said, yes. He said, they're so well behaved. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. And I moved them. But you know, what she doesn't understand is that it is not outside we behave well. <laughs> we do the, the thing about well behave outside, inside. So when we are at home, they are taught a lot. That's where we do all the shouting. Sit down here. Don't go there. Go to bed. Switch off the TV. Stop watching Dora. <laughs> I don't know whether they still do Dora these days. Ah, I had a son that was really, really serious about Dora the Explorer. That girl tortured my son. I won't tell you which son he is. So. <laughs> he will stand in front of the TV. Dora will say, where is my map? My son will say, behind you. <laughs> I say, she's not hearing you. He say, no. <laughs> he said, dad, I told Dora. <laughs> that is behind her. And then that one too, we say, really? Behind me? He will say, Yes. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, whoever designed this program is very wicked. <laughs> and then there's one called Teletubbies. I was writing my PhD when they were doing Teletubbies. You would just be hearing, again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> they would put on the TV. They said, say it again. Again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> I'm going to switch off the thing. When my head is boiling, I'm trying to write this. <laughs> Anyway, we do all those training in the house. When they get out, they are well behaved. It goes with them for life. Today, I stand up when I want to stand up and do things. I go for appointments, lead prayers, do many things to time because I was taught like that, to be disciplined like that. Train children to be disciplined. Let children know that you don't eat all the time. It is not real to be eaten every time. Let children know that you don't play all the time. Let children know that there are times you need to be serious. I like joking. I like laughing. When it's time to play and laugh, let them laugh and play. It is all part of making sure that we... You notice I have not talked about spiritual things as much here. Because these things are principles that apply whether you are a Christian or you are a non-Christian. The manifested in the flesh before justification of the spirit is what happens to everybody on this planet, whoever you are. The final thing is that Jesus exemplified capacity for natural and physical work. He exemplified capacity for natural and physical work. Matthew chapter 13, as I start to bring this to a close, verse 54. He said, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and this mighty works? <laughs> Very important, verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this, is this not mother not called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? They could not separate what they saw him do in the carpenter's shop from his ministry. I told you before 30, he was hardworking. He was inquisitive in the temple, but he was also studying his father as a carpenter. And Bible history tells us that he, Bible theologians actually tell us that he was very, very good in the crafts. And this lets me to un come to a point where we must understand that man, regardless of his spiritual state, has an inherent capacity for fruitfulness, creativity, and dominion. Whether he is Hindu, whether he is agnostic, whether he is an atheist, or Christian, Muslim, he has an inherent, Genesis 1, 28, the Bible says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. That is a command that is given to everyone born of a woman. Even the covenant of marriage that Christians want to claim and appropriate to themselves is a covenant for humanity to multiply. It's a covenant with mankind. That's why you can be fruitful, whether you are Muslim or whatever. You can have a successful marriage in court. The only difference is that in that state, you still are not justified and no promise of eternal uh, glory. 
However, you can live life successfully in the principles of the physical life. Every one of us must understand this. We saw in Genesis chapter 11, the people who were trying to build a tower, the Bible says the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, verse 2, that as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of China and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and break them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves. This was their problem. Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let us make a name for ourselves. Hallelujah. These were people who did not have the fear of God. But look at what God said. They did not have the fear of God. They said, we want to build for ourselves and make a name for ourselves. Look at what God said, verse 5. But the Lord said, come down and see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Somebody said, those that were manifested in the flesh. Come and see what they had built. They were still planning to build it. But as far as God was concerned, they've already built it. Because the mind of man, once it shows, once it catches a picture of what he wants to do, it's already done. It's already done. Every other thing is just a matter of time. It's already done. <laughs> he said, they have already built it. Verse 6 says, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they have one language. That's not the important thing for today. And this, what they begin to do now, nothing that they had proposed to do will be withheld from them. And he said, now let's go down and confuse their language. Because this is not the will, this is not God's plan for mankind. What I'm trying to say here, friends, is that I am very saddened when I hear people say, after all, there are many people who don't serve God and who are not godly today. And they use countries like China where, in fact, it's almost you know, a taboo to mention the name of Christ in many places. They use countries that are Muslim, mostly Muslims who don't know anything about Christ or know about Christ but not in the right way. They use countries like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, that they're building skyscrapers and building these things and say, these people don't have God. They don't, they don't name the name of Christ. They use people like Jeff Bezos and all these other big business people, Mark Zuckerberg, that, that probably never mentioned Christ or anything to do with him. And people say, after all, those people are successes and they have nothing to do with Christ. People forget one thing. This man born in the flesh can do anything. He can achieve anything. The only thing he cannot do is to save himself from eternal damnation. To build a house is nothing. To build a car, to build a plane, to build anything is nothing to a mind of a natural man that is just inspired in the right way and taught the right principles. Nothing. So Christians must not join the fray to say, after all, there are those people living well and uh, this and that. People say countries like uh, in Africa, Southern Africa, up to Nigeria, Western Africa, and those kind of places where they shout Jesus, Jesus, Jesus every day. That look at there's no infrastructure, there's no. The problem with those ones is because they have they keep putting bad leaders in place every time, and until God drops a bomb on their head to tell them that we have to do something about this leadership, I tell you, they by themselves will choose ignorant people and put them in office and say, "You are our leader, you are our leader, Mr. President." And then that one will come and show them hell. Then they say they are waiting for the next four years again. <laughs> that is their problem. It has nothing to do with Christ. Don't mention Christ. That the Christ that they are, there is nothing Christ can do for a people who do, even the rich young ruler could not get a conversion through Christ directly one on one. So if the people decide that they want to be corrupt and be misbehaving, God is just going to be watching. They can go to church five times a week. It doesn't matter. Everything has to come together. So let us understand this. Am I validating the fact that you can live without Christ and anyhow and achieve anything and that is good? No. I'm only saying that people should not be confused by that. If you see somebody prospering and they are people who curse God and they are doing well in their business and they are doing well, don't let it confuse you and to say so about me that I'm praying. Why am I not like that? No. They are just living to the max, the capacity that is inside man. If you tap into it yourself, even just naturally, God will take you places. Not to talk. So let us understand this very well and let us not be confused. The reality is that God will always endow on people 
people who will be entrepreneurial and cause people to be employed and make prosperity of town. God will always endow those gifts to work anyway. They were born with a purpose. The day Zuckerberg was born, maybe 30 now, 31, how old is he now? 32, early 30s, I believe, years ago. The day he was born was the day it was established that this will be the agent through which the world will be super fast connected in the biggest platform on social media. It was established for a purpose. Now, the purpose of him, if he is to give his life to Christ and become a child of God, has to be established for him to go to heaven. Him or anybody to go to heaven. He can make the billions. We can use the platforms. We can use the things. So that we understand, we are not better than anybody. We are only people who have tapped into the grace that has appeared to all men. And God's desire is that everybody comes to that. A child's entrance into this world, John 16, 21, should be a thing of joy. It should be a thing of joy. The Bible says a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth, John 16, 21, she no longer has that. She no longer has that for do you remember the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world? There is a joy in a human being being born into the world. We should celebrate every child that you give birth to. Don't compare your children with other children, not even their siblings. Celebrate their birth. Celebrate their birth. Let them feel they are the most important thing that has ever happened to humanity. Not in pride and arrogance, but for them to know that they are born with a purpose and they should enjoy and live out that purpose. But John 3, 3 makes us to understand that the greatest purpose on earth is that everyone must be born again. He said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I'd like to leave you with those thoughts this morning. That you are manifested in the flesh and are manifested in the flesh means that we are here to fulfill purpose. Let us walk in the fullness of it. Let us help our children at their vulnerable stages to walk in the fullness of it. Let us keep doing everything we can to maximize the potentials that is in being manifested in the flesh, the potential for dominion. I'm sorry to say many Christians are very lazy. Many Christians are very lazy. We can pray and we think when we pray, we can pray out laziness. You can't pray away laziness. You use work to kill laziness. You get up at the right time. You read. You study. You write. You do your job well. You research. You go for excellence. Then you pray for grace to be able to deliver. You don't pray and then you sit down there waiting for things to happen. You are manifested in the flesh for a purpose. Because you have been justified in the spirit already, you are in a better position to now lead our world that is in their need of understanding what it means to be born again. And so this morning I'm going to pray that by the grace of God as we come together around the communion table that we will all make a fresh commitment to working with God in our manifestation in the flesh in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us pray.